Welcome to the electrolysis lesson for extension science, lesson C 3.13 in the textbook. And this is the first lesson I'm recording using the new equipment. And um, I hope you all enjoy it. Well, you're presented here with the title, Lesson Objectives and Lesson Outcomes, that I'm sure you're all used to by now. So we're just going to round up the bigger picture. So we're going to look at electrolysis, we're going to look at the meaning of electrolysis, we're going to look at some of its applications. We're also going to examine, right, so when you get to the B and the A grades, you need to be able to examine electrolysis and show what's happening using ionic half equations, which are going to end up being balanced. So I'm going to explain that to you here and I hope you'll get it. So outcomes for D. Sorry, that would be my baby Evan in the background. Please excuse him. Nothing I can do about that, really. It will just add to some of the fun. Anyway, let's get on with the lesson. So please forgive me if it's a bit staccato. It's the uh, first time I'm using this equipment. But if you've all seen the Khan Academy, um, I hope I can just be a little bit of that. But anyway, let's move on. So, electrolysis. What does it actually mean? Well... Electrolysis, let me write it down here so you can see it's spelled like this, as you've seen from the title. So, electrolysis. Now, you see, lysis, let me change the color and bring the brush stroke down. So, now, lysis literally means splitting. And no guess is for what electro means. This means electricity. Alright, so it literally means splitting with electricity. Now, a very famous British scientist, Sir Michael Faraday, was one of the pioneers of electrolysis. And for the C3 controlled assessment you're going to be doing in 2012 you hopefully when you get to the a star stuff will be looking into some of faraday's laws of electrolysis because they relate current with the amount of substance made now let's rewind a bit now why does it mean splitting with electricity well for example if you take sodium chloride molten sodium chloride that is because you see sodium chloride being an ionic compound is made of ions in its solid form as you should know from c1 you should know that so uh, sorry excuse me c2 you should know that solid sodium chloride isn't able to conduct electricity because the ions are not free to move if you take liquid or molten sodium chloride then it does indeed conduct electricity molten sodium chloride will is simplified into its constituent elements namely sodium and chlorine there's the word equation right now sodium chloride in this case is the electrolyte so let me bring that back to red so an electrolyte an electrolyte is essentially a liquid that conducts electricity they are either they're, they're basically solutions or they can be aqueous solutions of ionic compounds Or they're basically molten forms, right, of ionic compounds. And it's going to take me a little while to get used to writing with the digitizer. Um, so forgive my my less than neat handwriting. I hope you can read it. All right, let me switch the colors just to make it look a bit snazzier. Now, this is the word equation for... Okay, let me do a slightly 
chloride to green. This is the word equation for the electrolysis of sodium chloride. So if I write electricity here, um, you can, uh, okay, electricity. Sodium chloride will become sodium chlorine. Hence, electrolysis. We're splitting the sodium chloride compound into its constituent elements, sodium and chlorine. Now, I hope you all know that the formula for sodium chloride is NaCl. Okay, so NaCl, molten sodium chloride is going to be represented with the state symbol L. NaCl is going to become Na liquid, right? It's going, uh, sodium will be liquid because sodium chloride being an ionic compound will have a very high melting point. So in order to melt the sodium chloride, you need to have the temperature very high. When the sodium is made, it will also be a liquid because the temperature will be above the melting point of sodium metal. We're also going to get chlorine. Now, chlorine is a diatomic gas, so we're going to have to write that Cl2 gas. Now, in order to get this to balance, like I hope you all know, we're going to have to uh, add some numbers. Now, because we've got two chlorine atoms here in this chlorine molecule, I'm going to need to add a two here to make two chlorines. Now, by doing that, that gives me two sodium ions over here, so I have to add a two. So there's my balanced uh, simple equation. Now, that's not all. We will be examining this in terms of half equations. But before we do that, I'd like us to have a look at the this uh, C grade objective or outcome should I say so we basically defined electrolysis I've quickly defined electrolyte now we're going to move on to this stuff and the C part so you need to be able to draw and label a diagram for the lab apparatus used for electrolysis so how do we do that all right so let me scroll down here let me use black I'm just going to put the brush size up to two. Now, where there's electricity, well, when we do electrolysis, okay, so this is the uh, so diagram for laboratory electrolysis. Now, we use DC, direct current electricity, for this, for the simple reason that we don't want the electrodes to switch their, 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 their charge through the experiment. So we have a DC battery, so we draw one cell, a few dots representing other cells, and then we draw another cell there. Okay, excuse the diagram, I'd like you to draw this with a ruler. Now, you should know that the long terminal the long line represents the positive side of the battery. One way to remember that is if you remember this long line being able to be split into two to make a plus, and that will make that the negative side. I'll draw a connecting wire. Of course, to see if the circuit is functioning, we're going to add an ammeter. That will tell us whether the current is flowing through the circuit or not. We're then going to create our two electrodes which we connect in series right. and then those electrodes we're going to stick into some sort of receptacle like a beaker within that beaker we're going to put our electrolyte electrolyte now a couple of things so this is the positive side of the battery, so this makes this the positive terminal, or the positive electrode. The positive electrode, why don't we label it red? The positive electrode, oops, excuse me, let me rub that out. Don't know why that didn't turn red, let me try that again. So, uh, click there. Now, the positive electrode, oops, still got it on rubber, excuse me. Like I said, I'm new to this. The positive electrode, there we go, right, is known as the anode, okay? Remember that, that's one of our key words. So the anode is the positive electrode. Conversely, the negative electrode is known as the cathode, right? 
Okay, now the cathode and the anode were named first. Now, if we're going to use sodium chloride right, as our electrolyte, now we're going to we're going to do it in liquid sodium chloride first, just to keep it simple. Now, the electrolyte is sodium chloride. Now, if you melt this, essentially what happens is the ions are free to move. So we dissociate, the ions dissociate. Dissociate means fall apart. Now, you should know that sodium, because it's in group one, will have, the, the sodium ion it forms will have a charge of plus one. I'm also going to represent, I'm going to add the state symbol liquid because it's in liquid form. The chloride ion, <coughs> excuse me, will have a charge of minus one because it's in group seven. Had seven electrons, gained a single electron, so now it has to have a charge of C on minus. Now, the chloride ion is known as the anion. It's called the anion because it's attractive to the cathode. Just bring that down a bit. Attracted to cathode. Oh, God, not the cathode. Just testing me there. It's attracted to the anode, right? So the anion, which is negatively charged, is attracted to the positive ion, obviously. I mean, positive electrode. So it's attracted to the anode. That's why it's called the anion, right? It's the anode's ion, right? Hence, anion, right? So the negative ion, anion. The positive ion is the cation, right? And it's attracted to the cathode. Now, there's all sorts of ways you can remember this. Um, some people say that you can remember that the cation is positive because the T looks like a plus, right? So the cation is positive. And that's attracted to the cathode. Um, all sorts of ways you can remember this. All right. Anyway, so there's my sodium ion. There's my chloride ion. Now, if we look here, what happens is I'm going to draw sodium ion here, Na+. Now, the Na plus ion is going to migrate. It's going to be attracted towards the cathode. All right. And the chloride ion, Cl-, minus, is attracted to the anode. And reactions take place. So what one would observe is that around the cathode, sodium metal would begin to build up. Okay, it's hot, so it would melt. So you'd have a pool of sodium metal. Okay, and around the anode, you'd see bubbles forming of chlorine gas. Right, so... How can we represent what's going on? Well, this is where ionic half equations come in. And the concept of oxidation and reduction. So let's just do the half equation. So you all see that? Okay, good. Remember, you can pause the video. You can, well, this is the beauty of thing. You can pause the video. You can take notes. You can write questions. And then you can ask me those questions in lesson. Fair enough. So let's write what's happening at the cathode first, right? So we're going to do half equations. So here are half equations. So this is the way I like to do it. So we say, look, at the cathode, right? So you can just write cathode. Or you don't even have to write that. You can just write the equation, okay? So what we have here is the cation is Na+. Plus. Let's write liquid because of its state. Now the cathode, it is attracted to, I mean, sorry, the cation is attracted to the cathode. Now the cathode is going to be covered in electrons. That's what makes it negatively charged. So what happens is the sodium ion bumps into the cathode and picks up a single electron. Now the sodium ion, because sodium is in group one, right, because sodium is in group one, if it gains a single electron, it becomes a sodium atom. Okay, so we just write that as NaL. So now, essentially what we've done is we have reduced, okay, we have reduced, I'll come back to that, this sodium ion back into 
the sodium atom, the metal atom. Okay, that's the half equation. If we write at the anode, okay, what we have is something else going on. So we've got a chloride ion. Now, this isn't quite finished yet because we're going to have to balance them. So just bear with me. So we've got chloride ion, which is in liquid form. It's attracted to the anode. Now, the anode is positively charged. That's why it's attracting the chloride ion. As soon as it, as soon as it hits the anode, it's going to, the, well, the anode is going to rip that electron off. Okay, It's going to rip the electron off. So it becomes a chlorine atom, right? And an electron. Now, this is where something I find students sometimes a little bit confused. Right, so you want to look at the before and after. So here's the chloride ion as it hits the anode, and the anode rips that electron off and turns that back into a chlorine atom. Likewise, this is the sodium ion before it hits the cathode. The cathode's covered in electrons. As soon as the sodium ion hits the cathode, that electron is absorbed, if you like, by this sodium ion to make it a sodium... Uh, oops, what happened there? Sorry about that. To turn that into a sodium atom. All right now, chlorine doesn't like to exist as atoms. It's unstable. So what happens is two chlorine atoms will pair up together, form a covalent bond to give us the diatomic molecule Cl2. That is how chlorine likes to live. Cl2, chlorine gas. Now it's a gas because we're way above the boiling point of chlorine, so we write a little g. Now, this doesn't balance, you see, because, let me just change the colour to make it look nicer. Now, a uh, a well, a chlorine molecule is made up of two chlorine atoms. We've only got one chlorine ion here. So we need to write a two in front of that to make two chloride ions. Excuse me, cl chloride. Remember, the anions always end in ide. Well, the simple anions do, but you should know that from C2. Now, Two chloride ions become two chlorine atoms, which form one chlorine molecule. Each chloride ion gives away one electron. Right? So in order to balance this, we've got to write a two here. Fair enough. So now we've got two half equations that work well by themselves. But they don't work well together. So in order to balance these two half equations, what I need to do is I need to balance the electrons. So here I've got two electrons. Here I've only got one electron. Simple. How am I going to balance this equation, the electron, with that one? Well, I need to add a two here. Now, if I add two electrons here, surely two electrons are going to satisfy, if you like, two sodium ions. Those two sodium ions will then become two sodium atoms. So there you have it. Half equations for for the uh, electrolysis of sodium and chlorine. Well, for the electrolysis of sodium chloride, the sodium ion. And the chloride ion. Now, we need to relate this to oxidation and reduction. So hopefully, you will all know that wonderful mnemonic that us science teachers like to teach you. Oil. Rig. Okay, so I think back in C1, you may have been presented with this. Um, where we taught you about oxidation being the gaining of oxygen by a substance. And... That, that was tantamount to a, a substance losing electrons. So the mnemonic becomes, we've got red, I like red, is oxidation. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Whereas reduction, being the chemical opposite, is gain of electrons all right so remember that oil rig oxidation is loss of electrons reduction is gain of electrons now let's have a look at what's going on so if we look at here what's happening the sodium ion is gaining two electrons to form two well to form a sodium atom two sodium ions gain gain two electrons to form two sodium atoms. Therefore, at the cathode, we have reduction. 
Now, you always get reduction at the cathode because the cathode gives electrons to the cation. So the cation gains electrons, so you have reduction. Rig, wonderful. At the anode, what we have is loss of electrons. So you see the, the, uh, the, the, the excuse me, the anion, the anion hits the anode and the anode rips, yeah, it rips electrons off the anion. So the anion loses electrons. So oil, oil, oxidation is loss of electrons. So we, at the anode, we always get oxidation. So very useful mnemonic that is. Okay, and um, there you go. Half equations balanced and explaining reduction in oxidation by the cathode and the anode respectively. Wonderful. So let's have a look at our objectives again, just to see what we've done. Okay, so we've defined the following keywords, right? Electrolysis, electrolyte. We've defined cation as a positive ion, anion as a negative ion. The electrodes, the electrodes being the cathode and the anode, respectively, right? The cathode being the negative electrode, the anode being the positive electrode, and oxidation and reduction. Oxidation being the loss of electrons and reduction being the gain of electrons. We've drawn and labeled the diagram for the lab apparatus used for electrolysis. There we go. Um, and, well, we've identified cations and anions just for one compound, sodium chloride. So, let's go and talk about that now. So now, let's look at identifying the ions, cations and anions, in some ionic compounds. So the best way to do this is by referring to a periodic table. Now, here's a couple of examples. Let's, let's look at an example, magnesium oxide, MgO. Well, as a matter of fact, this is a bit like in C2 where you're going to need to um, identify the ions in order to work out the formula for magnesium oxide. So magnesium oxide is MgO. Next time I will, I will actually just come up with a name. So magnesium oxide is MgO. Now, look, magnesium is in group two. There it is. You see, group two. Now, being in group two, it's going to have two electrons in its outer shell because it has two electrons in its outer shell. It's going to lose those two electrons when it forms ions. So magnesium oxide. Or so, so magnesium is going to be Mg. Two plus, okay. Because it's the positive ion, magnesium is going to be the cation. Now the oxide ion, right? It's going to be O two minus. Why is this there? Well, oxygen is in group six, has six electrons in its outer shell. So when it forms an ion, it needs to gain two electrons to achieve a stable octet. You know full out to show so that means it's going to have a charge of two minus so there is that's going to be my anion right get the picture so let's try different one um, let's try um, aluminium right, I'm just gonna make something up aluminium uh, fluoride. Fluoride. Well, what group's aluminium in? All right. Well, aluminium. It is in group three. See it there? Aluminium's in group three because it's in group three. It has three electrons in the outer shell. Um. Well, it has three electrons in the outer shell, so it's going to lose three electrons to form an ion. Now remember, it's always easier to lose three than it will be to gain five. This is the general rule of thumb. Now you should know this from C2. So if you're going to four mines, you always do the simplest thing possible. 
simplest thing is to lose or gain the fewest number of electrons. So aluminium is in group 3. It loses 3 electrons, so it's going to form Al3 plus ions. Right? Fluorine, well, fluoride ion, okay, comes from the fluorine atom. Fluorine's in group 7, it's a halogen. Being in group 7, it's got 7 electrons. Now, in order for it to become stable and have a full outer shell, it's going to be easy for it to gain one electron to fill that outer shell to make eight electrons than it is to lose seven. So the fluoride ion becomes F minus plus the positive ions are the cations, so aluminium. Al3 plus is the positive ion. And F minus is the negative ion. Get the picture? Wonderful. Now, I'd like you to get your periodic table out and try the following examples. Let's change the color for fun. Let's go to blue. So, first example, I'd like you to try lithium oxide. Second example, I'd like you to try calcium sulfide. Sulfide with pH, we're not in America. Third example, let's try magnesium um, iodide. All right, some easy group one and group two metals. Let's try iron. Three oxide. Hopefully, you know about the <coughs> the different oxidation states of iron, the different forms of iron, and other transition metals. And let's also try the fifth one. Let's try nickel two. I'm just making this up. Let's try nickel to uh, nitride. I'm not even sure that exists, but it's not not a problem. Okay. Um, pause your video now. Have a go at these, and I'll go over the answers in a second. Yeah. Pause it. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you've had a go at all of these now. So let me go over them now. Look, lithium. It's in group one. Okay. Nice and easy. Lithium group one is going to be Li plus. Right? One electron is out of shell, loses that electron. Okay, Li plus. Oxygen to form the oxide ion is in group six. So as discussed before, it's in group six, has six electrons in its outer shell, has an atom, it gains two electrons, become O2 minus. So it's Li plus O2 minus. This, as a compound, would be written as Li2O. Right? Good way to remember is that two drops over here. See that two goes. The cation, that one we go over there doesn't. We don't write it, so Li2O. Wonderful. So lithium's a cation. Oxide's the anion. Calcium sulfide. Calcium. What group's it in? Well, it's in group two. So being in group two is going to lose two electrons, so it's going to be Ca2 plus sulfur. Is in group six, just under oxygen, so that becomes S two minus. Right? Cation, calcium is cation, sulfur is the anion. If you're interested, the compound is CaS. Magnesium iodide, right? Well, magnesium is also in group two, so it's going to have a charge of two plus. The iod, the iodide. Iron is I minus because iodine is in group seven. Gains an electron to become I minus, so that's MgI2 as a compound, right? That's a cation, that's the anion. Iron three oxide, right? Um, really straightforward the transition metal ions are. Special property of transition metal ions is that they can have multiple oxidation states. Another way of saying that is that transition metal ions. Or transition metals can form more than one ion. And normally what we do is in the name, 
we represent the charge of the ion in Roman numerals. Right, now this is ion 3 oxide. Now you must remember that in ionic compounds, um, we always write the cation first and then the anion. So it makes our job a lot easier. So look, ion 3. So we know ion is a cation because it's written first. We know it has a charge of 3 plus. So it's just Fe 3 plus. All right. The oxide ion, as before, is O2 minus. So there we go. So it's ion 3 plus, O2 minus, cation and ion. If you're interested, the formula for ion 3 oxide is Fe. Okay, that 2 goes there. So it's Fe2. O is 3, goes on to the other side. It's Fe2O3. But cation and ion. Wonderful. Nickel 2 nitride. Nickel is also a transition metal. You can form multiple ions. Here, this is the Ni2 plus ion because, well, it's nickel 2. Nitride, all right, now, nitrogen is in group 5, right? Uh, doesn't form ions very often, but I just made this up. Look, nitride ion, because it's in group 5, nitrogen is going to gain 3 electrons. It's easier to gain 3 electrons than to lose 5. So the nitride ion is N3 minus. Right. So there's the cation. There's the anion. If I want to, f if I want to write the formula of this compound, which I'd have to Google to see if it exists, it would be Ni. Okay, so write Ni. Then I write N. Okay, Nin. Right. That two goes next to the nitrogen. That three goes next to the nickel. So it'll be Ni three two. Um, all right, the writing of the formulae is the, you know, it's not the scope of this lesson, really. It's something you do in C2, the writing of ionic formulae. All right, uh, something that's going to come up next lesson is what a salt is. Now, literally, a salt, different kinds of salt, but simple binary salts are made up. So salts are composed or are compounds. made up of uh, metals and non-metals okay that's non-metals not non-metals for example look all of these there's my metal there's my non-metal there's my metal there's my non-metal there's my metal there's my non-metal. So you get the picture. Um, now, not all ionic compounds are salts. Okay, it's important that you notice that. But all salts are ionic compounds. Um, metals always form positive ions. Well, the vast majority of the time, they form cations. They form positive ions because they lose electrons when they form. Uh, non-metals, the vast majority of the time, are going to gain electrons. Non-metals have a much higher affinity. Okay, that is electronegativity. Not a word you need to know for key stage four. But they have much higher hunger, if you like, for electrons. So they will always gain electrons, and they will always form anions. All right. So there's a simple way you can use to work out uh, which is an anion and which is a cation. Wonderful. So. That deals with this, okay? In the pack, you're going to have your own uh, set of activities for that. Now, write ionic half equations for the reactions that go to the cathode. Now, we've already done that for sodium chloride, okay? But let's have a look at aluminium oxide, right? Aluminium oxide. Now, um, I want to talk about this because the uh, electrolysis of bauxite, which is an aluminium ore, is how we purify aluminium from its ore, right? Now, bauxite contains Al2O3. So let's scroll down to the bottom. So hopefully I have space for this. Yes, wonderful. And we're going to talk about the uh, electrolysis
Oh, let's call this the the uh, extraction of aluminium by electrolysis. So let's do that. Extraction. of aluminium by electrolysis. Wonderful. Just right. Okay. So I've just pasted in this diagram from the internet showing. The basic apparatus we use to extract aluminium from bauxite right which is uh, like a reddish brown um, ore right uh, okay from bauxite uh, using electrolysis so it's a uh, stress of aluminium by electrolysis okay from bauxite Is that okay? Pen. Okay, where is it? Okay, I've got it here now. Thank you. Bing, bing, pen. Aha. Right, such a village by electrolysis. Okay, from bauxite. Bauxite. Okay, which is a, it's a red brown solid. Right? And basically, it's aluminium oxide. Al two O three with impurities. We get it from the earth. Now, when we do this, well, we treat the the bauxite with an alkali, okay, uh, to remove loads of the impurities. Now, this causes creates a white solid called alumina, right, which contains lots of aluminium oxide, right. So we have alumina. Oops, what happened there? Get that rubber out again. Oh, where's that rubber gone? Here we go. Hard rubber. Right, so let's get rid of that unsightly dash. Right, so we get bauxite, which contains this. We add alkali. Right, so bauxite is red brown. Alright, we add an alkali. And that produces alumina, which is white. Okay. Now, alumina may contain loads of aluminium oxide, but as we know, solid ionic compounds, aluminium oxide included, will not conduct electricity. So we need to melt it. Right. We need to melt this. Now, um, all ionic compounds they tend to have very high melting points. So it's going to require an awful lot of heat and therefore cost a lot of money in order to melt this the, this aluminium oxide right so what we do right is is we we get the aluminium oxide we heat it and we add molten cryolite right this this lowers the melting point so what we do is we mix it and we dissolve this in molten cryolite right Dissolve it in cryolite. This lowers the melting point of aluminium oxide, saves money. Saving money is always good, especially in these days of of a credit crunch. So we're told, right? Now, there are special tanks where there's like a bit of an opening at the bottom. You see it here? Now, these tanks, okay, are made of steel, right, which is basically an alloy of iron, and they're lined with graphite. See that? They're lined with graphite. Um, slightly different arrangement this time. So what happens is we put our aluminium ore dissolved in molten cryolite, which lowers the melting point. We have the the anode on top like this with graphite. See it there? And we have the cathode as the container itself lined with graphite. Now, a current is run through it. Yeah, so we run a current through it. Doo -doo -doo. And what happens? Well, the aluminium. Oh, where's my cursor gone? Oh, excuse me. So, 
the aluminium ions, so let me do that in red, the aluminium ions, which are Al3+, plus, as we mentioned before, the aluminium ions are going to be attracted towards the cathode, right? So the aluminium ion goes towards the cathode. Now remember, the cathode is going to be covered in electrons. So each aluminium ion is going to pick up three electrons, you see, because it has a charge of plus three. That turns it into an aluminium atom. Now this is all at very high temperature, so the aluminium ion is going to be liquid. The aluminium metal will also come out as a liquid. Now, as it happens, the aluminium metal is denser than the aluminium molten cryolite solution. So the aluminium metal will sink to the bottom of the container. That's shown here. You see that molten aluminium? That then is drawn off out of this tap, if you like. So a certain amount builds up, they open the tap, they pour off molten aluminium. The oxide ion, O2 minus, will be attracted towards the anode. Okay, so let's write the half equation there. So we have O2 minus. It's liquid. Yeah. So the O2 minus attracted towards the anode. When it hits the anode, the oxygen atom has two electrons ripped off it. Now, as we know, oxygen doesn't like to exist as atoms. It likes to pair up with a, another oxygen atom to make an oxygen molecule, which is O2. Right, so that means we need two oxide ions. Okay, the two oxide ions each give up two electrons, so we need to write about that too. Okay, and make four. Right, see, so two oxide ions uh, give you one oxygen molecule and four electrons. Now problem we have here is that these do not balance all right so we need to make them balance so we need to find the lowest common multiple that will make them balance so very easy what we do is we're going to times the three but so we times them by each other right so times the three by four to make 12 okay so let's cross that out so different color different color all right let me just undo that um blue, I like blue. Let's cross that out, we times it by four, so that becomes 12, right? Now if I'm times in the electrons by four, I must times everything else by four, so aluminium becomes four, and aluminium ions become four, and I get four aluminium atoms. Likewise, I wanna make this 12 to make them balance, so what number do I need to times by four to make 12? Well, that's three, so cross that out. 12 electrons and becomes so if I times that by 3 I've got to times this by 3 that becomes 3 oxygen molecules and 6 oxygen ions right so there we have it there are the balanced half equations now there's a little bit more to that because if we observe what's going on here is we would notice that the gas coming off it isn't actually oxygen, right? It isn't actually oxygen. If we were to capture that gas and test for it, we would find out that it's carbon dioxide. Now, how do we get the carbon dioxide? Well, it's quite simple, really. Let's scroll down a little bit further. Well, what's going on <coughs> is that it's very hot. We have oxygen. And this is graphite. Now, graphite is just a form of carbon, you see? So, the carbon in the graphite, so I'm going to write graphite, because sometimes you can do that, because you see carbon comes in different molecular forms that we call allotropes, all right? So, it's essentially just pure carbon. That graphite is going to react with the oxygen gas that's produced, Right, and it's going to give us carbon dioxide gas. All right, so all good and well. Now, if we want to balance this with this, right? So we have three oxygen molecules being made. All right, so let's stick a three in front of that. Okay, now if we've got three of those, 
gives us six oxygens. All right. We're going to need three of these. And if we've got three of these, we've got three carbons, so we need three of those. So there we have it. Two ionic half equations showing the electrolysis of aluminium oxide in bauxite. Okay. Balanced yeah, by the electrons, the two halves. Um, and then the reaction of oxygen, well, sorry, the reaction of the oxygen produced with the carbon, to produce carbon dioxide. Now, what this means is that the the the, uh, the, the anodes, they are wasted away. You'll see it kind of sort of waste away as the reaction goes on. And these electrodes will obviously need to be replaced. Okay, but that's not a problem because graphite is quite cheap. Um, also, just out of interest, as a reminder, if we apply our oil rig pneumonic, right, we can see that the aluminium is gaining electrons. So obviously we have a reduction. Okay, because the aluminium, which was in an oxidation state of three plus, yeah, because it had lost of uh, three electrons, is now gaining three electrons each. So so it's reduced. Okay, remember we always get reduction at the anode and we get oxidation of the oxygen. Okay, ironic. Or is that irony? I don't know. I don't think it is. We get oxidation at the cathode. Wonderful. Right, so let's return to our objectives. So we have done, I can write ionic half equations, reactions occur at the cathode and the anode for some simple ionic substances, e.g. sodium chloride and aluminium oxide. Um, I think that more, well, this does actually conclude the online lesson on electrolysis. Um, for the A and the A star work, you can do that in lesson because there is uh, some reading to do in the textbook. Um, so that's you're going to do that there uh, the experiment you'll have to design yourselves there are a series of worksheets and exercises for you to consolidate the learning from D upwards so thank you very much for listening and I will see you soon goodbye